Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight for this sub special subscriber only event with Colin Woodard. More than 800 of you have registered to be with us. So welcome. Tonight's event is just one small way to thank you for supporting our journalism at the Press Herald. Your subscription funds our work, which is more vital than ever as we weather this pandemic together. And I can't say enough about the resilience of our staff during these past several months. From reporters and editors to our press operators and delivery team, we are fueled by our mission to bring you the news to keep you safe and informed. And so let me now introduce you to tonight's host and guest. Catherine Lee has been web editor at the Press Herald and Maine Sunday Telegram for the last three years and before was our city editor for five years. She previously worked at the Tampa Bay Times and the Tuscaloosa News, where she led the newsroom to a Pulitzer Prize in breaking news in 2012. One of Catherine's many responsibilities at the Press Herald is overseeing our reader comments that are integrated throughout PressHerald.com. And I wanted to let you know that one of your benefits of your subscription is that only subscribers can post comments on our website. So if you have any questions about that, you can reach out to Catherine. Colin Woodard has been the state and national affairs writer for the Press Herald and Maine Sunday Telegram since 2012. He was already a best-selling author and world-traveling journalist when he joined our team. In the past eight years, he's covered some of our top stories and published major projects. One of his first big stories about the profit motive behind Maine's virtual schools won him a prestigious Polk Award. His 2015 series Mayday about the enormous harm that climate change is doing to the Gulf of Maine was a finalist for a Pulitzer Prize and his most ambitious project, Unsettled, was a 30-chapter series that chronicled 50 years of oppression among the Passamaquoddy people. We, I believe, have posted a link to Unsettled in the chat box if you hadn't had the pleasure of reading that. It's available again to subscribers only. And now this March, when the coronavirus pandemic hit Maine, Colin quickly pivoted to become one of our lead watchdog reporters, holding our leaders accountable for their role in guarding the safety of Maine residents. Collins reporting has shown a spotlight on failures and gaps in testing and data sharing in our state, and his work has led to upgrades in the way the state re reports data to the public. Among his stories, he explained early on why the state wasn't meeting its own benchmarks for reopening the economy, he revealed that Maine was the only state not calculating the daily positivity rate, and he's the only person in Maine regularly tracking and sharing active hospitalizations. He even tied the disparities in how COVID-19 is affecting different regions of the country to his American nation's work. In addition to American nations, Collins' books include American Character, The Lobster Coast, the Republic of Pirates, Ocean's End, and of course, his most recent book, which we'll be talking about tonight, Union. Thank you for being with us, and please welcome Catherine Lee and Colin Woodard. Thank you, Lisa. And welcome to everyone who's joining us tonight for an evening with one of my favorite coworkers, Colin Woodard, to talk about his new book. So Colin, let me start by noting the irony in the title of your book, Union. You write that, as, that we as a country have never really been united, even at the beginning. You open with the surrender of Cornwallis at Yorktown, and that was the last time the 13 colonies were actually united in overthrowing a common enemy. Can you talk about how the colonies thought of themselves before the revolution and how that influenced their thinking on where their now united country should go from there? Yeah, uh, so one of my previous books, American Nations, argued that there's never been one America, but rather several Americas, and that the differences between those Americas, those regional cultures, tie back to the differences between the different colonial projects that formed on the eastern and southwestern rims of what's now the United States. So the New England colonies were very different from the Dutch settled area around New York City, from the Appalachian backcountry, from the Chesapeake Tidewater, from the Spanish settled Southwest, from the Deep South, and so on and so forth. And that um, they were often uh, rivals and even enemies during the colonial period, lining up on the opposite side of key colonial um, 
questions and even conflicts like the English Civil War or the Glorious Revolution of 1689. And then there was a revolution. There was a, um, a, a threat to all of them uh, via British colonial policy in the 1770s that led them all to band together to protect each of their idiosyncratic ways of life from a, uh, a centralized power that wanted to demand conformity within the empire and they would lose autonomy. And so they rose up in a war of an independent struggle and lo and behold, they won this war, but that left them suddenly together in this thing called the United States that nobody was really sure what it was. You know, was it a, a, you know, a treaty mechanism? Was it like NATO? Because the Continental Army and the Continental Congress sort of felt like that. Was it after the first constitution and maybe even the second, still more of a European Union-like entity, a confederation of, of sovereign states? You know, like the, uh, like, um, you know, uh, that, that each state remained sovereign within a federation that controlled, say, foreign policy and trade and the like? Or was it really supposed to be a unitary nation, like a, a, a solid one with a, a, a single past and purpose and identity like the ones that, say, Germany was trying to forge at the time? And nobody really knew the answer for sure. So, you know, unity was one thing that was lacking. And it was something that I've, of course, always wondered about while writing American nations and talking about it is, you know, obviously at some point after the, you know, the 1850s and 1860s and the Civil War, we came to believe ourselves to be one nation and always to have been one, that we forgot this essential um, fact of our, our, our fractured republic, our fractured and balkanized uh, federation. How did that happen? When did we end up creating a story of national unity and purpose and shared history and all of that, that succeeded in obscuring all of those things and allowed our country in many ways to move forward and accomplished remarkable things. Who did it and when? And so union is the story of that. And as you point out, it came out of disunity. Um, what I discovered and where the story really opens in the 1810s and 1820s was at a time when still nobody knew for sure what the United States was supposed to be. And this fact was becoming a national security crisis. The um, ad hoc solution to this problem had been uh, to celebrate the shared struggle of the American Revolution and uh, having overthrown a monarchy and established a republic and hey, we all did it together. Isn't that amazing? George Washington was wicked cool. You know, he's a, you know, he's a sign of all of our virtues and almost demigod model for what a Republican citizen should be. Um, and that that, you know, all the colonies rose up together. But by the 1810s and 1820s, that was becoming a less and less satisfying explanation, not least because the generation who had fought the revolution was dying and fading from the scene. That struggle was ceasing to be a living memory and therefore had less strength to hold the country together as a sort of idea, especially as all of the tensions over the profound differences between the different colonies and regions and states, right? These are places that were founded by people with different ethnographic and religious and cultural characteristics early on, different political platforms, different economies, and of course, entirely different ideas about uh, human freedom, whether natural rights were a real, really a thing or not, about the relationship between individual liberty and the Oh, I think you muted yourself. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't think I muted myself. It said the host. Oh. Oh. Maybe we got to, yeah. Anyway, I'm back. So, um, so the story is the story of how out of that disunity, a story was created and fought over, over uh, to try to make us one nation with one story and one past. You know, a, a giant exercise in ideas and um, in like mass construction of a nationhood. So while I was reading the book, I was also watching the film version of Hamilton. They kind of go hand in hand, really. And one phrase from the musical kept coming up in my head as, as I was reading, who tells your story? The idea of who's in charge of the narrative and how they shape it is really kind of at the heart of how we view ourselves as Americans and our country, isn't it? So why did our early historians and statesmen make such an effort to nail down a unique sense of what it means to be American? Well, I think they all realized that the country needed a unifying story, but even early on, they entirely disagreed on what that story should be. Disagreed so profoundly that the, the ideas that they were disagreeing about would lead us towards a civil war, which 
hundreds of thousands would die. I mean, it was a uh, massive disagreement, but the realization that there needed to be a story and that this was all important was very clear to many people. I mean, there'd been secession movements um, in the 1790s, in the, even with New England and during the War of 1812, trying to secede in 1814. The, the discussions over the differences that were emerging over the future of slavery and therefore of the you know, promises within the Declaration of Independence about the inalienable equality of humans and stuff, those tensions were growing, not receding. And so all of the, um, all of the solvents to our Federation's unity were at work. And therefore, if we were to succeed and carry forward, all of these people who decided to come to bat to try to create a story knew that this was very important and that the stakes were very high, even as they themselves disagreed. Right, because um, unlike a lot of nations creating themselves or states creating themselves, we had this federal arrangement primarily to, to protect the regional cultures. That meant there wasn't a central ministry of culture, a department of culture like a European state would have that would make these decisions and you know, as a government entity hand them down. There was none of that, it was all decentralized. So the effort to do it was much more crowdsourced, if you will, even if the crowd they were sourcing it from was rather exclusive and, uh, and not necessarily representative of everyone who was living in the Federation. Yeah, so you use that, the, uh, you tell the story of America's search for a unified national identity through five men, five statesmen in the uh, 19th and early 20th centuries. Why did you choose these particular five? Well, I was trying to find who are, I wanted to tell the story um, through the people who ended up fighting it. Not only because it would make for a more interesting story when you're writing what's really a historiography mm -hmm. of ideas, right? That's, everyone's already asleep out there, right? But <laughs> ideas are the most in, like, powerful force in human societies and events. And yet they seem abstract. Once the idea is out there in our collective consciousness, it has enormous power. I was interested, how does it get there? You know, who creates these ideas? How do they get fought over and disseminated? Especially in the past, you know, pre-internet when it might be a little less obvious. And so my goal was to find you know, go back to the inception point before there was clearly a, 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 a narrative that everyone agreed on and find when the first obvious drafts started popping up in the psyche, in the, in the documents, the things people were talking about, the speeches and working my way back to find the beginnings of that and then who confronted it and work my way then backwards, you know, forwards through time until a point, and that's where union ends, where one idea or another had consensus over the Federation broadly for the first time, that it wasn't just an agree a disagreement between, say, New England and the Deep South, but where there was broad agreement for the first time. And that's where the book ends. Those are the bookends mm -hmm. of the story. So I was just trying to find in the historical record who were those nexus point people who somehow brought together the various threads that were out there at a time and successfully packaged them and, and promoted and disseminated them in a way that infected the consciousness, the zeitgeist out there. And so that was kind of the, what I was doing is just trying to find who those people were, which took a lot of combing. Some of the big people you run into very quickly, but trying to understand the relationship between them and where their ideas came from and stuff to distill it into a, a few key characters for narrative purposes um, took a lot of sifting and a lot of digging and, and you know, refining of the ore. Uh, so talk about these five. You start out the book with a uh, New Englander. Uh, let's see, um, George Bancroft. Why him? Correct. Well, he's the first person to come out with a, a draft, and a draft answer to this. And George Bancroft's largely forgotten today, but he was the um, most celebrated historian of the 19th century. Uh, in the United States. And he, uh, he had been born of New England parentage, parentage. He was a descendant of the early Puritans. His father was a famous congregational minister. He attended Phillips Exeter. He attended Harvard. He graduated at 17 or 18 years old. He was born in 1800 and he lived all the way through to the 1890s. Um, he came out of, he was, he was a Yankee and a New Englander um, to the umpteenth degree. And this is important because when he graduated from Harvard at 17 years old, 
uh, President Kirkland sent him, along with a, a number of other promising young graduates, to get this rare thing that nobody had in the United States, a doctorate, a doctoral degree. He, President Kirkland wanted to transform Harvard from a sleepy boarding school it had been into something more approximating a modern research university like we might recognize. Only such universities really only existed in Germany. They were being created there with a new, you know, rational based scientific approach and these new doctoral degrees based on, you know, empirical research. And so Kirkland realized this was a big deal and sent Bancroft and several other young men to Germany to earn their doctorates. So at 17, Bancroft shows up in Germany uh, and in the aftermath of the Napoleonic Wars and literally studies under some of the great romantic German intellectuals who are creating the European and German ideas of what a nation is and where it comes from. He studies under the Humboldts and under Herring and Hegel personally. He does this crazy backpacking journey through Europe um, with letters of introduction from his professors that open the gates of the, you know, the world of letters to him. He's hanging out in dinner parties with Marquis de Lafayette, walking around the countryside with Washington Irving, hanging out in, the, in Goethe's cottage with him, bumps into Lord Byron in Italy and hangs out with Byron and his mistress at their villa drinking wine and talking about events, dances with empresses and princesses, and then finally returns in the early 1820s to his sleepy, you know, New England um, you know, provincial background, everyone appalled by the way he's acting and dressing and all of the strange mannerisms he's picked up because this is uptight New England. And he very quickly, after failing in a variety of pursuits, sets down to write the story of what the United States is, combining his New England background, this idea that, you know, from the Puritans that um, we are a covenanted people, right? Like a Old, Old Testament people with a relationship with God tasked with a mission to uh, create a more perfect society on earth. He takes that, you know, an uh, errand in the wilderness and, and, and create a city on a hill. And he bonds it with these German ideas that nations are organisms, like living organisms, and that they start from a seed with their own plans and instructions already built into them and will naturally, um, from those seeds, um, uh, evolve into exactly what they were always intended to be. And he, his argument was, oh my gosh, you may think that South Carolina was different from Massachusetts, was different from Virginia, but really they were all planted by divine purpose with the same seed. And they were all growing towards the revolution and the creation of this unique and exceptional American Republic. And that we were tasked by God and destiny to advance human freedom as set forth in the Declaration of Independence, right? That humans are are, are born free and inherently equal and have unalienable rights to life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness and consensual self-government. And that's what defines us. And we are, we are destined to cross this continent and to bring uh, the, the, the torch of human liberty forward. And we can't possibly fail because we've been chosen, God got involved in the constitution and everything else. And he wrote this in a 10 volume history that took most of his life to produce, but each volume of that history was an epic popular event. So it's Bancroft, who also served as a statesman. He was a cabinet official in the Polk administration, as secretary of the Navy and acting secretary of war. He issued the actual orders that led to the war in Texas and the annexation of California. He served later as ambassador to, to uh, London and to Berlin. So he wasn't just a uh, intellectual in his ivory tower. He was also a doer who actually affected some of the changes. So that was Bancroft, this sort of towering figure with the first draft of a civic nationhood, an idea of an America defined by its ideals um, and loaded with all these other things that you will recognize in the way we talk about the United States, about us being exceptional and perhaps you know, God chosen all those things. Those were all first packaged and brought to the public by Bancroft. But juxtaposed with Bancroft's story, you also have um, uh, William Gilmore Sims, who is pretty much George Bancroft's kind of counterpoint, a uh, very proud South Carolinian, much more narrow view of what this new country uh, was intended to be and who it was intended to, to serve. Absolutely. Talk about Sims. Yeah, that, that civic national narrative about us being you know, uh, uh, united by our ideals was immediately countered by William Gilmore Sims and the uh, group of intellectuals around him. Sims was from Charleston and from South Carolina. And he said explicitly, no, you know, Jefferson was wrong. 
the words he wrote in the Declaration of Independence were wrong, that um, people are clearly not equal, that there are gradations in a hierarchy of humans, that the correct um, democracy is more modeled than the classical republicanism of the ancient world of ancient Greece and Rome, you know, where a, a, a select group of people had the, priv the liberty or the privilege of practicing democracy and that servitude and slavery was the natural lot of the many and is the way a republic ought to work. And in fact, it's the genius of the allegedly superior Anglo-Saxon race that has made America possible and that as Sims put it, we are the homeland, or more appropriately, the separate homelands of this virtuous Anglo-Saxon people. And that the words in the Declaration really apply to them, and that the other people are, are incapable of becoming good Republican citizens, and anyone can see that self-evidently. So he was basically a vision that would become, a, you know, it's a white supremacist vision, even narrower at that time, and that it was mm -hmm. You know, um, many people who would fit in the category as white later on wouldn't even qualify under Sims's definition. And he also argued that we were, you know, each organic and true nation was like South Carolina and Georgia and Massachusetts, and that the Federation allowed us collectively to succeed, uh, each on its own terms with its own history. So that was the beginnings and the budding of an ethno-national vision, right? A white supremacist vision that said the promise of America is not universally open. It's only open to a subset of Americans. And in the American mythology, because of our, our stated goals and purpose, uh, you can only cast out the others by arguing that they're incapable of Republican self-government. And so that would begin a very long tradition uh, in the United States for this ethno-national vision. Uh, you also include in your book, um, the only person of color, uh, an escaped slave, Frederick Bailey, who we all know much better as the social reformer, Frederick Douglass. And it would seem that Douglass's life is really kind of the embodiment of uh, Bancroft's vision of this, uh, this country that was made for freedom and idealization. And yet Bancroft's vision didn't include uh, black men or former slaves at all. That's, Why did I mean, you put Douglas in, in, into the narrative? Yeah, Douglas is sort of the pivotal figure in the whole thing for very much the reasons you're describing. You know, he's a, he was a fugitive slave, a little bit younger than Sims and Bancroft, escaped slavery in Maryland, um, you know, was uh, uh, escaped in the, with the most advanced technology of the day. It would be like escaping slavery in the SpaceX rocket and getting to orbit. He boarded one of the very first passenger trains that ran from Baltimore northward and was patrolled very heavily to make sure nobody escaped. He went in disguise and succeeded and was brought by the Underground Railway to New Bedford, Massachusetts, where he was working as a day laborer and discovered by the abolitionists, the Garrisonians who discovered that this young man had this incredible firsthand story to tell about the evils of slavery and what it did to society. But not only that, he was an incredibly gifted orator. He was so good at telling it. And he had covertly and secretly taught himself to read and write and turned out to be an incredible writer as well. And they put him on their lecture circuit and he quickly eclipsed them, broke with them, and would rise to become a national and international celebrity at a time when writing and oration was the way that you communicated ideas and, and disseminated them. And he used his considerable talent, voice, and, and prestige to argue the entire time, not only just the evils of slavery, but for Bancroft, the vision that Bancroft had articulated about the United States being dedicated to those ideals in the Declaration of Independence with this very important caveat that we hadn't achieved them. We hadn't come anywhere near achieving them. And he, his life was a firsthand you know, story and depiction of the hypocrisies and shortcomings that, that uh, of not, actually achieving that. And he was arguing and imploring Americans to do so in the whole pre-Civil War period, during the Civil War, going to Abraham Lincoln, meeting with him twice in the White House during the war to push him, because Lincoln did not start with this war is about you know, free, uh, free ending slavery or about um, ensuring that you know, all men being created equal actually happens. He was prodded and got there step by step in part through Douglas. And he kept arguing it during Reconstruction and the collapse of Reconstruction in the face of the terrorist campaign by the Ku Klux Klan and others to uh, successfully roll back the political emancipation of African Americans in the South and all the way through into you know, the late 19th century before he died. And his 
arguments in him articulating this, the need for essentially white Northerners and then white Americans to achieve these ideals and stand up for them because he believed they were really good ideals. We were just failing to meet them. In, in the ways that he described the United States and its purpose in his speeches are some of the most amazing depictions and distillations of what the United States nationhood should be that have ever been put together, which is why he's so celebrated. You know, he, and he, he argued for, you know, many of the people who were at the time being excluded, he argued specifically for them, for um, women. He was friends with Susan B. Anthony's family when he first moved to Rochester, New York. He uh, spoke at the Seneca Falls Convention um, in favor, in fact, pushing the uh, attendees of the, of the Seneca Falls uh, Convention to adopt a, um, a women's suffrage amendment because it was still very controversial at the time, arguing for um, Catholic immigrants later on, for, uh, for Chinese against the Chinese Exclusion Act, for Irish and so on. So he really stood up for it and was a key, perhaps the key figure in the 19th century promoting and pushing for this civic national vision. I thought it was so notable in the book, he's really the only person of the five who really has a vision that encompasses everybody, people of color, people from different nationalities, women. Um, Absolutely, and you know, uh, he was, you would think on paper, someone like Bancroft who had written all those glorious words would embrace Douglas, neither Neither Bancroft or Sims, I've read thousands of pages of each of their letters. They never mentioned Douglas at once. He's like a non-person. And Douglas was a towering figure that was impossible to miss during their lives. In fact, when Douglas was, uh, was touring the United Kingdom and Ireland, um, giving speeches to packed auditorium, thousands of people, you know, published in all the newspapers, he was like an absolute phenomenon for months while George Bancroft was the American ambassador in London. And, and never met him. Never mentions it. Doesn't even not meet him, just he's, he doesn't exist, even though he's arguing for the very ideals in the book. Douglas is, you know, uh, you know uh, is constantly criticizing Bancroft for this in jibes and stuff and in some of his letters and speeches in his newspapers, but Bancroft is above even responding and Sims, of course, uh, ignoring him altogether. So yeah, he was, he was uh, by far the, the figure with the most inclusive vision of any of these five, and of course, way ahead of many of, the, of his contemporaries um, you know, across the country. So tell us about uh, Frederick Jackson Turner. He's the only Midwesterner in this group, and like, he, his idea of America kind of looks westward, manifest sure. destiny and the idea of pioneers and kind of taking over the, the entire country as uh, America's future. Yeah, so uh, he and the final figure, Woodrow Wilson, are both um, younger. They're um, children during the Civil War and come of age during the, the post-Civil War period in Reconstruction. Frederick Jackson Turner does so on the frontier. He's born in um, Western Wisconsin in Portage at a time when Wisconsin was still essentially the frontier, in quotes. And uh, he came with a Midwestern perspective. All of the other uh, people in this story are, you know, from the East Coast, and he was the one person from the West, and saw things a bit differently, and not surprisingly, he believed and argued that what made Americans Americans was the Midwest, that when settlers crossed uh, the Appalachian Mountains and began colonizing the interior West, the Midwest, and the, and the Mountain West, and the Plains, that that's when they became uniquely their own nation and own people because he was taking essentially that civic vision of George Bancroft's and sub swapping out God that, that uh, divine providence had decided that America had this mission. He was substituting that out for the most, uh, you know, the, the science that was all the rage at the time, Darwinian science of natural selection and environmental selection. And he believed that, um, that human societies were like organisms. And when they arrived in a new natural environment, they would be shaped by those natural conditions and evolve around them. And that all these separate settlers coming into the Appalachians with all their baggage from Europe and from the East Coast, encountering this um, frontier environment would all um, become more like each other. And it was, an, into his thinking, an Edenic environment, right? It was uh, separated from the, 
the uh, taint of old world history from the feudal influences um, of uh, England and France and so on that had infected East Coast society, but that out in the West, uh, Americans and settlers could truly find their inner Republican spirit, you know, that they were uh, egalitarian and uh, self-governing self and full of civic mindedness and all the rest. And he packaged this in something called the frontier thesis. And this theory, which he first uh, presented at the Chicago World's Fair in uh, 1893, went, you know, went viral, as we used to say, uh, all over the place uh, uh, in scholarship and popular articles, in the way history was taught at the university level, at the high school level, at the primary school level, it infiltrated novels and film later on and radio and the whole idea of the West and the coonskin cap and John Wayne and Daniel Boone and Davy Crockett, that that's somehow the foundational experience of America. That all ties back to this idea that Frederick Jackson Turner put forward. Only Turner himself realized very quickly, he was a demon researcher and a procrastinator as a writer, that the data that he kept looking at didn't line up. That in fact, the more he looked at it trying to prove this, he was looking at county level maps of the settler, settle, settling of and colonization of the Midwest and West, expecting to see the different settlement streams coming out of New England and coming out of the Appalachian South and so on to um, slowly meld into one, except they didn't. No matter what he looked at, there were persistent differences, be their politics or dialects or the way people handled crops or their attitudes towards such and such an issue that persisted over time. And he would spend the rest of his life, decades, trying to write a magnum opus about America and its sections, saying, no, the frontier wasn't really the, the most important thing. It was the differences in these regional cultures that which resemble European nations. In other words, and I did not know this when I was writing American Nations a decade ago, I didn't learn that he was doing this until I researched Union, but he was trying to write something that might have approximated American nations. Only he never ever finished it. And even when he tried to talk about it, he was like a, you know, a, an early successful pop band who gets a number one hit single in their first album. And then for the rest of their lives, every time they tour, nobody wants to hear the new stuff. They only want to hear that. Nobody would really listen to his section stuff. They all wanted to hear about the frontier thesis. But he had a, obviously an enormous influence on the way Americans think of themselves, even uh, if he himself didn't believe in the theory uh, that had made him famous and so shaped uh, Americans. And his thesis com almost completely ignores the people who were already there. Uh, in the sure. <laughs> yeah, you <laughs> can only see the West as an Eden if you like Turner, and this is also following in the tradition of many movies and, and popular culture, that Native Americans became scenery. It's like they sort of, you know, drifted away into the background as the settlers who were the true stars of the narrative arrived. And that there had been these, you know, conquest and you know terrible atrocities and ethnic cleansing and all the rest would be found nowhere in in Turner's rosy narrative of things. Um, so yeah he entirely missed that and uh, other contemporaries um, like um, you know Buffalo Bill with his Wild West show. Buffalo Bill is a contemporary of Turner's. Uh, he had set up his entire massive you know 3,000 actor show outside the gates of the Chicago World's Fair when the same place that Turner um, um, first un, uh, presented his frontier thesis. And you know, his whole story um, at the uh, Wild West show was one that sort of reversed the, um, the, the victim and the, uh, and the perpetrator, right? It was always a story of the, the, the peaceful settlers arrive in the West and these terrible Native Americans start attacking them and then some hero like you know, George Custer comes and saves the day. So that was the other way of doing it, is just a sort of, uh, obfuscate and change what was going on. Um, Turner didn't do that, but that gives you a sense of how Americans were thinking about themselves at that time. And they wanted an optimistic story, which is why everyone latched on to Turner's thesis. The country was changing, the railroads were, were connecting the two coasts, things were being industrialized, large numbers of immigrants from places that hadn't had large immigration were arriving. Everything seemed to be spinning out of control and labor trouble and plutocrats and could the Republic survive? And this story gave uh, hope and optimism uh, to what America could achieve. And so people latched onto it, even if it didn't really make all that much sense on scrutiny. So you've mentioned that the, the pivot point for us really as a country was the Civil War and Reconstruction. 
And Reconstruction was an effort to bring the slave states back into the idea of a single United States and also equalize the races by giving former slaves, well, the men at least, full participation in public life. But in fact, it had the opposite effect once Reconstruction was over of driving some white people even further to the, the vision of a country led solely by, and a country made for white Anglo-Saxons. Um, you say in the book that the North won the war, but the South won the peace. Um, is the end of Reconstruction the point in American history where this idea really takes hold and mythologizes the failed rebellion? Yeah, I mean, certainly the whole lost cause idea and that mythology comes out of the failure of Reconstruction. I mean, Reconstruction was essentially Yankeedom, the greater New England space in the triumph of war and occupation, trying to remake the occupied Deep South, especially in greater Appalachia in the Yankee image and to create a civic national norm in the occupied states. And of course, the occupied states resisted the, the, um, the, the white oligarchy and its followers with a actual terrorist campaign to um, prevent that, right? For a short period during Reconstruction, African-American men could vote and hold office. And there were African-American senators in the US Senate and congressmen and in South Carolina, where there was an African-American majority, they had the control of the actual state legislature and you know, passed a universe, you know, properly financed public schools and ended uh, you know, property requirements to vote and all of these things. And this counter movement, literally a reign of terror to kill people and murder anyone who got in the way, um, led to the rolling back of all those things. So that was a terrible defeat, but the crowning moment where you could say that the South had won the peace was the rise of my fifth character to the Oval Office in the form of Woodrow Wilson, mm -hmm. uh, because it's his ascension, his election. He was the first deep Southerner elected to the White House uh, after the Civil War. In fact, I believe before the Civil War as well. Uh, he was raised in Augusta, Georgia during the war and then uh, lived his adolescence in Columbia, South Carolina, which had been burned by Sherman's troops. Uh, and his father was the leading figure of the Confederate uh, Presbyterian Church and author of a uh, widely celebrated in the South um, uh, uh, um, oration about how uh, God uh, ordained slavery, which made him enormously popular at the time, an enormous white supremacist who influenced Woodrow Wilson, Woodrow Wilson looked up to. And from that background, Wilson was consistent throughout his academic career and throughout his political career. Um, you know, his, his books all argue for this Sims-like ethno-national vision of the country, that only certain people are qualified to participate in the Republic and African Americans in the South absolutely are not, that the Klan were the heroes of the story, rolling back this foolish-minded effort by the North to allow, you know, a, an incapable people to, to be controlling the legislature. And ignoring, we're not mentioning, because Wilson, of course, you know, would have witnessed many of the events in the South, but not mentioning anything about the actual reign of terror. And then in office, he segregates the federal government, the union government that had won the war in theory was segregated. And then he celebrated the first Hollywood blockbuster film, The Birth of a Nation, a film again, celebrating the KKK as the heroes of this epic film for rolling back um, African-American political emancipation in the South and a, a film that was um, based on a book by one of Wilson's best friends and graduate school um, uh, buddies, uh, Thomas Dixon Jr., who was the co-producer of the film. The film was facing um, enormous protests in cities across the country and was faced with possible bankruptcy because at that time in 1915, the courts had not yet decided that artistic works were protected speech under the First Amendment. So cities and mayors constantly censored uh, films and, uh, and stage plays and other productions that were considered contrary to public morals. And there was enormous pressure for them to do exactly that in the major markets for the film in New York and Boston and elsewhere. And uh, that would have bankrupted uh, the filmmakers. And they, so they did a Hail Mary pass and went to Woodrow Wilson and asked him to help. And he screened the film in the middle of all these protests to his cabinet in the White House. And on the strength of that, Thomas Dixon the next morning ran across town, 
to uh, Chief Justice White and at, uh, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court and asked him to show it. And Justice White, having been a member of the KKK, thought the film was just wonderful and screened it in an enormous ballroom for congressional leaders and the rest of the Supreme Court justices. And you can imagine how the news of these two events, the tacit endorsement by all of the leaders of the federal government of the film made it uh, politically impossible for a mayor or a governor to ban the film as being unacceptable when it was being shown in the White House and to the Supreme Court justices with, uh, with applause. So that shows you just a taste of just how extreme Woodrow Wilson was. You know, he's, he's um, getting quite a lot of uh, bad rap lately. And he's actually, when you really look at him, much, much worse than you've even heard so far. Yeah, I think in high school, when we all learn about the presidents, what we remember of Wilson is uh, his foreign policy, um, not the virulent racism uh, of his, his presidency. I mean, it was really in his administration that segregation was legalized in, in every part of, of public life, uh, starting with the federal government. Um, endorsement of, the, of this film, I mean, Birth of a Nation mm -hmm. literally inspired the second Ku Klux Klan. It came you know, the, the, right. the second KKK was inaugurated on the eve of the film's premiere in Atlanta by a, a bunch of people who founded it riding up onto a mountainside and burning across and then riding in when the film's premiering at the theater on their horses, wearing their hoods and stuff to proclaim the new KKK. It was like a pop culture inspired, you know, revival. That's how influential it was. And it just, just briefly, his foreign policy was infected by all this as well. You know, I would, you know, I'm an East European and Balkan, you know, historian originally and foreign correspondent over there. So I always identified Wilson with this idealistic, but perhaps, you know, um, um, poorly thought out attempt to recarve uh, the Balkans in Eastern Europe based on the principle of, of national sovereignty and national self-government, that the subject peoples of the Austro-Hungarian Empire and the Ottoman Empire should have their own countries, so there'll be a Bulgaria again, and there'll be a Slovakia, and so on and so forth, the Yugoslavia bonding them together. But what wasn't mentioned in the histories that you and I probably read was that, yeah, there was self-determination for white European nations but in the same uh, League of Nations, the non-white territories that had been controlled by, um, by Austria-Hungary and the Axis powers um, in the Middle East, in Africa, in Micronesia, were absolutely not given self-government. They were put into uh, hierarchical mandates based on their supposed ability to govern themselves with different le uh, levels of uh, tutelage uh, to white European mm, trust powers. And so, you know, the effort by the Japanese, who were the one non-white allied nation at the uh, Paris Peace Conference, they tried to include an extra point in the League of Nations uh, Charter, a point that, uh, that banned racial discrimination. And Wilson, it, it was voted on, and the majority of the delegates voted in favor of this resolution. Wilson, who was chairing it, declared it had failed because it had not been unanimous, an entirely arbitrary decision mm -hmm. to per, basically to protect the apartheid system that still existed in the American South. So yeah, very extreme person and character. So I'm going to ask you one more question before we go to the audience questions. Um, and this one is a contemporary question um, about our ongoing struggle over the symbols we employ as markers of America's past. Um, there's a growing movement to rename the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma for the late John Lewis, who almost died there as a freedom writer, for instance. But how do these protests over uh, Confederate statues or flags or the names of military bases speak to this centuries old debate over who gets to define what kind of country we are and who gets to fully participate. Uh, do you see parallels in today's racial rhetoric to that of the past in this struggle that we're still trying to figure out to tell our country's story? Absolutely. I mean, we're that, you know, that ethno-national vision of Sims and Wilson, that white supremacist vision, was the dominant vision in the 1910s and 1920s. And then it was essentially overthrown in the 1960s, uh, you know, at places like Selma, but it wasn't completely vanquished. This battle over our identity, over America's soul between this ethnic and civic vision has been going on for a very long time. And we're still seeing on the streets, in the debates over the Confederate flag, in the toppling of Confederate monuments and the discussion over Woodrow Wilson and Christopher Columbus and Justice White's statue uh, in the, it was also in the Capitol and at LSU. And all of these things are a discussion about 
you know, our ideals and our commitment to them. And when there are figures who are, celeb you know, there, there's a, to me, there's a, as a historian and, you know, I, I lived through the changes in Eastern Europe. I was an exchange student in 1989 and was there when communism toppled. Lots of statues were toppled. Lots of history that had been written one way was rewritten in another way and new statues and figures were chosen. Some of them very unsavory figures from the 1930s as well. I mean, there's a long history of humans deciding what parts of their history they're going to celebrate. And when, you know, there's a couple categories, there's people that you're celebrating because they did some remarkable things, but hey, they also had reprehensible views and stuff that aren't what you're celebrating and you can discuss them but it's a little bit more of a slam dunk when the people that you're talking about are being celebrated for deeds they did that were reprehensible. I mean, that's an entirely different thing. And it's hard to find very many things that Woodrow Wilson did that aren't, when you actually look at them, um, aren't pretty reprehensible. And so you wonder why is it that you're celebrating this? So yeah, I think that that is the discussion that's going on. And it basically boils down to if you're going to celebrate in public spaces with monumental uh, statuary, certain people, the argument is over essentially, do they comport with American fundamental ideals or not? And then, you know, you, there's a spectrum, right? You can start talking about Washington being a slave owner in Jefferson and we can have those discussions. But to me, there's, there's an obvious distinction between those two things and how we evaluate it. And uh, the former, many of the figures we're talking about, it's very much a slam dunk discussion, a dialogue over this long struggle that, that Union traces the origins of. Okay, um, I think I will uh, turn to some of these audience questions that have uh, been put in the chat. Let's start with Robin Ratcliffe. Uh, here's the question. I have just finished Union, excellent and fascinating, but I'm more discouraged than ever about the possibilities for a unified vision for our country that would save it. What do you think? Well, I think that we're presented right now with an opportunity that we, that, well, opportunity that we had best seize, right? What's happening now, the movement since the, since the murder of George Floyd and, and the discussions about symbols and statues and flags and everything. This is all about reasserting, you know, re-grappling with whether or not we're really going to stand up for those founding ideals and the Declaration of Independence, which I think in our national story, those are the ideals, right? There's, there's hubris and all kinds of things we can discuss about it, but fundamentally, when people, Americans are proud of the country and what it stands for, when America's turned the heads of other countries. It's been about when we've engaged with these ideals successfully and moved forward with them. It's always been a work in progress. And I think we're being, people are being asked again to stand up for them in a time of frankly peril. And I think that people are responding and I'm actually cautiously optimistic that this may be a watershed um, that will lead us uh, to a better place and a re-engagement with those things. Because, you know, as author of American Nations, I was arguing 10 years ago that Americans would be complacent to think that our country can't fall apart the way the Soviet Union does. That if you're messing and dissolving the sinews that hold us together, there are many, many historical, structural, cultural, and political reasons why we could fall apart. And I personally think that would be a bad thing for us in the world if it happened. Um, so, you know, this is an opportunity once again to recognize that and perhaps start rebuilding on the best parts of our tradition, the, the American experiment as we, uh, you know, in its best form. Uh, here's a question from Lonnie Graham, um, a little bit of a personal note. Uh, do you consider Frederick Jackson Turner your historical father or grandfather as an author, considering his lifelong devotion to geographical sectionalism? Well, I didn't realize it when I was writing American Nations that he had done all of this detailed work. I just knew him as the frontier thesis guy, and I thought that was nonsense because clearly the settlement cultures, you know, were uh, trumped all of that frontier stuff, at least till you get out to the 100th meridian. So I didn't know until writing this book that he'd done all those things. Knowing it now, I mean, there are there are parallels. I mean, when I was reading about in detail about his life and what he was researching and his effort in, you know, 1899 and 1910 to pour over maps, you know, the first cartographic detailed maps of soil types and, you know, population movements and population density, all that stuff that we look at all the time on the internet, the first 
analog versions of those were essentially being created and disseminated by the government in that time period. So he was at a cutting edge science of trying to look at the country and with all those new geographical tools to be evidence based and to, and to um, you know, get away from the Bancroft era of you know, flighty you know, oratory and rhetoric and actually anchor it to things. And the subjects he was dealing with are overlap a lot with some of the subjects I've dealt with. So I definitely you know, sense a, um, a kinship in the subjects he was trying to tackle. Um, but you know, it, uh, obviously he took a different view of our history from his time and place for sure uh, than I would today. So I don't know how, if we have an intellectual kinship, but we certainly have an overlapping set of interests a century apart. <laughs> uh, here's another question about your work as a historian. This one is from Cindy. I've always thought that Alexis de Tocqueville's Democracy in America was one of the most interesting books I've ever read, along with American Union, of course. What do you think of de Tocqueville's observations? And did you ever make use of them as you researched how the storyline of America was shaped? Do you think his observations have value today in understanding America today? Keep up the good work. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I mean, de Tocqueville is, uh, you know, one of the most keen observers of the um, American experience, particularly in the early Republic. Um, so yes, I think his, his observations have validity today. The one caveat I always have with him is essentially, although he did take some brief forays uh, in the South, most of his observations about the American character are greater New England space observations that I think he incorrectly assumed applied universally in the United States. And he makes a big deal about um, you know, the big differences uh, between the old world and the new where he could go to a hovel and you know deep in the frontier and encounter somebody who was completely literate and could talk to him about you know the books and the events of the day and how amazing that was um, but you know that would have been absolutely true as he was wandering you know western New York and the Ohio territory but that same observations would not have been true in the Alabama territory and Mississippi territory where there was no public education system you know the the early Puritans, for theological reasons, had started building taxpayer finance public schools on the frontier with universal or near universal attendance from the very beginning. That was not true in the other regions. So with that one caveat, um, you know, New England in the early days had a monopoly over many of the levers of like intellectual production. They had all the libraries, the universities, the printing presses, the newspapers, the colleges. Uh, far more than any other region, so they could control the narrative, as you might say. Um, so in a sense, it's not surprising that de Tocqueville gave them, a, you know, an uh, extra emphasis, but his one mistake might have been that that was only a minority share of the population of the country and that other regions of the country did not share in those experiences. So, you know, a couple more journeys with more time spent in those areas might have led him to have some other observations uh, keyed into some of the other regional cultures. Uh, here's a question from Lynn Bellew. Uh, I wonder why you stop with Wilson and you don't include a sixth American of more inclusive ideals, Eleanor Roosevelt or MLK? Would that be the next volume? Yeah, that would be the next <laughs> volume, right. So I set my goal for myself was go back to the beginning of the phenomenon and end when one of them, you know, wins the day, at least temporarily, has, the, has a consensus victory, uh, even if it's a short-lived one. And so that ended up being you know, circa 1818 to Woodrow Wilson's presidency circa 1920. And so if you had a volume two, the epilogue talks about the fact that this ethno-national vision that Wilson sort of presided over the triumph of was later vanquished again. And the second volume, if you wanted to write it, would be about all of that in the, you know, from the returning soldiers in World War I through the entire civil rights movement and, and everything that followed in mid and late 20th century America. But that story has kind of been told by others, you know, very well. I think this was the missing component in the prehistory of that story. And I didn't think that that would have been, I didn't think that the bookends would be where they were when I started the project. You know, I, I thought that this story would primarily be a story of the aftermath of the Civil War, that after a terrible conflict um, that had uh, nearly destroyed the country and killed so many people, that, you know, Americans or white Americans had to come up with a um, national narrative that could heal the country's sections back together and obscure the differences that had led to the Civil War. That's what I thought would be my story, only I discovered that the actual story started, you know, 50 years earlier than that. So 
even I didn't know where the bookends would be and didn't know who the characters would be until I was really diving in uh, pretty deep into the research. Uh, here's a question from Lonnie Grant. Do you consider Andrew Johnson or Woodrow Wilson more destructive to civil rights for African Americans? Oh my gosh. Well, or I can't say that? that I've analyzed Andrew Johnson as an individual to the degree I've looked at Wilson. So I don't know if I've got a good apples to apples perspective, but you know, they're, they're also operating in two different times where, you know, uh, an avowed white supremacist in the 1920s probably couldn't go as far as one could have in the 18, you know, 64 or five or something like that. Just their, their room for maneuver had been reduced. Um, so I'm not sure I got a good answer to that question, but I can assure you Wilson was quite bad and Johnson was no good either as to which one was, you know, the worst. I need to read more on Johnson in greater detail to, to have a apples to apples comparison. Um, a question from Gary Stern. In what ways do you or might you include American tribal nations in the narrative? Right. In the narrative of nationhood or the American nations uh, narrative? Um, either. Right. <laughs> well, they, so um, in the narrative of United States nationhood, right, the Native Americans were excluded from this whole dialogue, right? They were, right. Um, no Native Americans were taking the stage and had access to the, you know, the equivalent of the internet back then of having the stages and printing presses and audiences and uh, platforms that allowed you to take part uh, in the central spotlight in the you know, building of the story of who the U.S. would be. And that's a great tragedy. In fact, these people were, had many incentives to exclude or distort the truth of what had happened to Native Americans and what the Native American legacy was. You know, none of them were particularly focused on them. Uh, ironically, of the five, the one who, um, spent the most time in Native American territory and among Native Americans and in a way was the most sympathetic to them and carefully observant was William Gilmore Sims, right? The white supremacist guy from Charleston because he traveled as a young man in the back country of the South in what became the Alabama and Mississippi territories because his father, his, mo his uh, mother had died in childbirth. His father had left him as a small boy with his grandmother in Charleston and just disappeared. And he disappeared to the frontier in Tennessee, and he ended up joining Andrew Jackson in the War of 1812 and fighting within his troops, and then with his brother, moved with a small group of slaves to his little plan, you know, um, uh, frontier farm in the middle of nowhere, deep in the Mississippi Territory after a major uh, war with the Native Americans. And that's where Wid Will, uh, William Gilmore Sims, as a young man, travels by horseback and carriage all the way out into this frontier to visit his father and spends months with his father back there in territories where they're interacting, staying with uh, Native Americans. Uh, you know, he, in his novels, he was most famous as a novelist. He was a best-selling novelist in the pre-Civil War period. He was the leading uh, Southern and Confederate man of letters. And he wrote about the frontier, either the contemporary frontier or in the past. And his Native American characters in these stories are as fully developed as any of his, you know, Anglo-Saxon characters are. You know, he observed closely and, you know, had compared to his contemporaries, seemed to be rather sympathetic and understanding and empathetic of their position and plight to a degree that is kind of shocking in a novel you're reading from 1835 or 1840. Um, so funny enough, he's the one who probably had the most firsthand understanding and perhaps sympathy, although, you know, he was a white supremacist who believed that, you know, that only, you know, Anglo-Saxon chosen people should be uh, practicing the, you know, uh, having the full uh, benefits of the uh, Declaration of Independence and our Republican form of government. Um, I'm going to ask one more question because I think we're hit, about to hit eight o'clock. Uh, this question is from uh, Johnny uh, Derek Druck. What can you say about the role of women in the time you cover in Union? And did any women have influence on our nation's story? Yeah, well, absolutely had influence. I mean, among the characters who are in this story surrounding them are, I mean, Frederick Douglass quickly becomes friends with the Anthonys when Susan B. Anthony is a young woman and uh, is friends and has a break later with the early women's suffrage leaders with Lucretia Mott. And, uh, and then he, uh, you know, is helping um, as a node on the Underground Railway 
Harriet uh, Tubman is showing up mm -hmm. with her um, passengers that she's rescued. Harriet Tubman kept going back after escaping from slavery herself to, you know, behind enemy lines, back to the South to bring back relatives and, uh, and, uh, and uh, family members and even strangers and smuggle them back uh, to the North. And often they were headed on to Canada after the Fugitive Slave Act. And Frederick Douglass's house in Rochester was one of the stops. And she would regularly show up there and actually be staying at his house and he would be sheltering um, her, her passengers. Um, and she laid, you know, she and Douglas were both involved with John Brown before his, um, his unsuccessful raid at Harper's Ferry. Um, Ida B. Wells comes and, uh, and with Douglas at the Chicago World's Fair. I mean, these are all, these and many other uh, female individuals are in the story and involved in shaping what the United States would become. I think the distinction is why none of them are primary characters is their mission wasn't specifically to say this is the United States vision, like this is a story of the creation of the narrative of US nationhood. And that wasn't the primary mission of any of the people I mentioned in this. And it might have been in another world maybe where access to the internet of ideas of the 1830s and 1840s didn't exclude so many people. I mean, even Sims had this enormous fight just to have access to the way you disseminated information. He had, you know, he is a Southern partisan, deep Southern partisan. He had to spend every summer of his life just about in New York City to maintain his contacts with the publishing industry and the journals and intellectual circles to disseminate his books and his ideas because you just couldn't do it in the deep South. He tried, he, he founded and, you know, um, bankrupted himself several times trying to start literary journals of the South and, you know, writing political speeches and writing histories of South Carolina and stuff. But he himself would show you just how hard it was to do that in an entire region of the country, even as a plantation owning, you know, white oligarch, he had difficulty. You can imagine if you were, you know, women in the 1840s weren't allowed to vote, sit on juries, you know, inherit property, you know, so it made it much more difficult starting position if you're trying to do something as audacious as, you know, command an entire peoples to listen to your grand sweeping story of who they're supposed to be in their imagined nation and have, you know, everyone disseminated. You know, that's a, a, a pretty privileged spot and not surprisingly, um, most of the people who ended up occupying it had a lot of privilege to, to get and hold on to those, you know, mechanisms of dissemination. So um, since I have you um, and since I'm in charge, uh, I'm going to ask you one question, one more question Please. of my own. Um, how do you think we'll get to the civic ideals that were codified in the Constitution and the Declaration of Equality and Freedom? I mean, this is the narrative we all grew up on and we learned in school, but if it was challenged even from the beginning of this country's founding, how do we actually even realize that ideal? Right. I mean, we have to keep fighting for it. I mean, the the one of my previous books, American Character, sort of talks about, you know, where do liberal democracies come from, you know, uh, places that have these kind of ideals of trying to have as near to universal individual freedom as you can have and the balance you have to do. And one of the things that's very clear is, you know, humans, the idea that individuals would be free, whether it's free born and have unalienable rights and all that, is only a few centuries old, right? We've been around for, well, we've been around for millions of years, but you know, civilization has been around for five or 6,000. And even that as an idea in somebody's head is only a few centuries old. And we've only been experimenting, trying to actually do it in reality for, you know, 300-ish, and we're not very good at it. It's a really hard thing to do. And it took, you know, millennia of institutional development and ideas and stuff for people to even be able to contemplate something that's not, you know, essentially despotic or, you know, communal in the medieval sense, right? That everybody has their role and you stick to it. And so, you know, it, I guess my big picture is it's not surprising that homo sapiens are having a struggle doing this because it's a apparently a very hard and sophisticated thing for us to do. And we haven't succeeded in, you know, doing it <laughs> consistently over time. So I, you know, but, you know, I think we improve in general you know, if you were to go back a century ago around the world, I think the situation would be, you'd be more pessimistic than you would be even today. And so, you know, one has to keep um, holding on to these ideals, remembering their importance and, you know, fighting to see them to fruition because it's a, you know, it's a work in progress 
for all societies and certainly including ours. I would love to keep talking um, and I'm sure most of our audience would, would love to hang on and I apologize right now to everyone whose question I wasn't able to get to. Um, I think I need to kick it back over to Strawberry to wrap it up. Is that right? Uh, yes. Uh, the only other thing we wanted to mention is just if you enjoyed this event, we do have another event happening next week with Daniel and Marcia Minter um, of the Indigo Arts Alliance. I'm going to go ahead and pop the registration link right in the chat. But other than that, thank you everyone for joining us and please give us your feedback in our survey. Um, I want to thank Colin for this really insightful talk. It was fascinating. Thanks for your time. And thank you to everyone who joined us tonight. We appreciate your support of the Portland Press Herald, our events, and our journalistic mission. Um, as Strawberry mentioned, uh, join us again next week for our Main Voices live stream. You can register for that event on pressherald.com. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Have a good night. Thank you.